<laughs> you may not realize it, but I was once a weak man. Once a week's enough for any man. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, wah? Oh, I do feel queer. He became, I think, a caricature. He became a parody of himself. And perhaps that's what upset him most about himself. Romantic, sensitive, in search of the great love which he never found. Oh, I don't do it. I'm not. I know I'm asexual. I should have been a monk. <laughs> <laughs> not on your neck. <laughs> the much loved actor and comedian Kenneth Williams kept a diary for over 40 years. When these journals were published five years after his death, what they revealed caused a sensation. Kenneth has developed even more fans now as a consequence of the diaries than he had before. I mean, a lot of people have said that it's one of the best books they've ever read because it covers such a huge swathe of history. Um, it involves so many famous people, uh, but it's, it's just such wonderful gossip as well. Whether or not he thought that they would be ultimately published, uh, there was the need to express these other layers of himself. And the moment you put them into print, uh, or you've written them, they are real. That's the real Kenneth Williams there. There's a lot of lies in those diaries, you know. There's a lot of fantasy in those diaries. I know that for a fact, but I won't go say more than that. I think people get a very um, dark view of Kenneth from the diaries, but I think that's because the written word is so harsh. If you put down something in writing, it always sounds much worse than if you're expressing it. And, of course, Kenneth had his dark moods. But, I mean, for most of the time that I was with Kenneth, you know, he was a very up person. Kenneth Charles Williams was born in 1926. His family lived in King's Cross, over the hairdressing shop where his parents worked. It must have been difficult for Kenneth because, obviously, he was a fairly sensitive, artistic child, and his father was one of those old-fashioned type of cockneys, you know, and I think his relationship with his mother was very close, and the closeness with the mother, I think, probably caused a lot of friction. But I think Kenneth only went to the local school and... Uh, you know, was a cockney, really, as a kid, I guess. But, of course, to meet him later, you'd never realise that. He described to me once uh, this teacher. Uh, he said the teacher was very dishy, and, and he obviously fell in love with the teacher in a very innocent, platonic way. But the teacher, would, would, who taught English, would read poems, and the whole class would be spellbound. And he said, the moment that I was asked to read a poem, it was by Rupert Brooke, he said, I got up in front of the class, and suddenly I realised they were all listening to me, and suddenly I knew I had authority over them. And that was uh, a key moment. In 1944, Kenneth received his call-up papers to join the army. Not a natural soldier, he quickly found his way into the Combined Services Entertainment Corps. The OC lined us up and said, now because you're entertainers, I understand they had to all act, that's fine, but I, I want you to go about behaving like soldiers. I will not have a lot of this effeminacy and mincing about. <laughs> well, you could hear in the back row, get the madam, you're quiet. <laughs> and there was a civilian dancer called Barry Chat, who had the most extraordinary effect on the military. When he arrived in, the, in Burma, he was at the HQ, he was standing outside, and outside the HQ were several generals, brigadiers, with rolled up maps, you know, and field glasses, all standing there outside the HQ. And this dancer, Barry, did a pirouette about six times, vast, and very fast indeed, and then tapped this brigadier on the shoulder and said, tell your mother we're here, dear, put the kettle on. Camp. Uh, arrived in two senses at the same time, really. There was army and there was there was theatrical camp, and they were indistinguishable, really, for that troupe, because that was... But it, well, that was a revelation to him, I think, in lots of ways, and it was to lots of returning soldiery, because they realised that there was a sort of homosexual brethren. Suddenly there was what we now think of as a homosexual community. That actually existed in London, and it had its haunts and so on. Before he went away, he hadn't realised that. And it brought that suddenly alive to him. And it was something that was legitimised by there being so many theatre people in it. And so I think that was, that was very liberating for him. Returning to England, Kenneth was keen to continue as a performer. His father had other ideas. He said to me, you've got to have a trade, boy. It's no good going, because I said, I wouldn't mind doing a bit. Acting is rubbish. All the women are tarts, the blokes are poofs. You'll never, <laughs> never make any money because it's too hazardous. Kenneth thought it was a risk worth taking. 
He joined a theatre company and spent the next few years touring around the country in rep. It was the summer of 1954 and I went down to Bridgewater in Somerset to be the leading man in a weekly rep. And in the company was this young actor, well, younger than me, uh, Kenneth Williams, who was the juvenile character. And it was, um, we just took to each other from the start. We were, we were very much kindred spirits. Hands across the table. I went to visit him uh, above the barber shop. His father was the barber. And we spent the whole afternoon talking and he put on a recording by Johnny Ray. And we were lying on the floor listening to this music. And I was suddenly aware how beautiful he was. And there was a kind of sexual chemistry in the air. Neither of us did anything, uh, but he was luminous. He just lit up from within. Hands across the table. Kenneth thought that he was physically ugly. And this is what uh, was one of the problems why he could never have an emotional or sexual relationship with anybody else. He hated his body. He had a guilt complex about being gay. I'm, I'm quite certain of that. I think anybody who knew Kenneth well uh, did not really... Uh, Kenneth didn't accept... Really, I don't think he probably really accepted his homosexuality. He, he was very mixed up about it. Do you have to realise um, that in those days, um, anybody who was gay... I mean, the police, they could be arrested. And, um, uh, you know, they were arrested. People were arrested. And uh, dear old England, you know, always sort of behind everybody else. Um, it was really, I think, an absolute nightmare to be a, a homosexual. Stop messing about. <laughs> the Hancock radio show gave Kenneth his first taste of fame. This success was followed by rave reviews for a string of smash hit West End comedy shows. Kenneth Williams had arrived. What is your name? Please. Bailey. James Bailey. How do you do? Fine. Absolutely bloody fine. But I'll feel even better once you're in uniform. Kenneth found time to appear in a movie called Carry On Sergeant. It was to be the first of his 25 appearances in the Carry On series. As you were. I know it, I can feel it. Well, stop feeling it. Oh. Yearning for you, yearning to give you my all. But I don't want your all, I don't even want a little bit. And I usually have the blow wave. Yes, well, I'm no good at that, sir. But I know where I am with an iron. Mm. I think Kenneth loved in the early days the public acclaim that he got from the Carry On films because he was a terrible show off. And I mean, that side of his nature was greatly satisfied by the adoration the public had for him and, and possibly someone who, perhaps underneath it all, didn't have a great deal of self-confidence, although one wouldn't think that, was greatly boosted by this um, great worship he got from the public. Kenneth would get on public transport and uh, sort of pretend that nobody's ever going to recognise him. And that's, it seemed to be that Kenneth was one of those people that most people could recognise. He would behave in such a way that you'd soon know who it was. The receptionist said, Name! <laughs> <laughs> As with my face, I should have thought that question was superfluous. <laughs> so I don't know your name. <coughs> who are you? I said, well, I don't know your name. She said, well, I've got to announce someone, haven't I? I've got to announce you on the intercom. I'll send you up to the studio. What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> so I said... Just call me Kenneth, and I'll try and think of something to call you. <laughs> Kenneth continued to perform in straight theatre, but audiences loved him for the outrageous comic characters he played, especially on radio. In future, you want to use a bit of common. Years ago, he did Round the Horn. I mean, I have to say, in those days, I was still at school, and we weren't allowed to listen to Round the Horn. Sunday lunch times were not allowed. Hello, anybody there? Oh, hello, I'm Julian, and this is my friend Sandy. Oh, hello, Mr. Because uh, it was all innuendo, actually, and you know you were at uh, church school and you were just were not allowed to listen to that sort of thing. How can we help you, visage de coeur? That's French for art face. <laughs> <laughs> for a start, I'd like to brush up my grief. Oh, don't let us stop you if it gives you any pleasure. <laughs> he became the character that, the, that people wanted him to be when he was on television being interviewed. I did have a very embarrassing opening night uh, in a review once. Is, and that your, is that your real voice? Oh, yes, I always talk about it. 
<laughs> the Carry On films were so much of a family affair for him, which is why he carried on doing them, because they were, you know, his friends, people he enjoyed working with. You know, people have made great play of the fact that he'd probably be disappointed to be remembered for them, but they make people laugh. So if you're a comedian, why would you be um, disappointed about making people laugh? OK, he was a serious actor in the early part of his career, but, you know, he made the choice and went down the comedy route. What are you doing with your things? I'm sorry, sir, but for the good of Rome, you must die. But you're my personal bodyguard and champion gladiator. I don't want to die. I may not be a very good live emperor, but I'd be a worse one dead. Treachery! Infamy! Infamy! They've all got it in for me! Hans, nay. Be dead. <laughs> Kenneth Williams' erudite wit and outspoken personality were a surefire hit with audiences. He was invited to add spice to chat shows, panel shows, and host his own shows, transforming from actor to entertainer. Uh, that's a knockout, isn't it? <laughs> the French, I mean, not the song. Oh, pas grand prix, espionnage, gruyère, camembert, romage. Mayonnaise, all night, garage, RSVP, ma frappe sous His steadfast supporter and number one fan was his mother, Louis. He just adored her, he sort of worshipped her. And there was a lot of, of, of uh, Louis in Kenneth. I mean, she was very quick-witted, very sharp cockney, very quick turn of phrase, very strong personality. In 1972, Kenneth moved in next door to his now widowed mother. Although they saw each other every day, Ken's flat was still very much his own domain. You go into his flat, tiny hallway, to the left was not a very big uh, um, lounge. Um, he had a galley kitchen. Uh, which he never used, actually. I mean, to make himself a cup of tea. He certainly didn't use the cooker. Because the cellophane had been on the cooker for years and years and years and never came off. And then he had his bedroom, and within his bedroom, uh, a single bed in there, and to the right of that was his, his desk, where he did all his writing, and that was it. All the other people in the flats had, had um, cleaners to come in and clean, and he couldn't afford a cleaner. So he would run the hoover up and down and put on a funny voice pretending to be his own maid. I don't think anybody could have lived with Kenneth Williams. Um, I, I think he would be the first to say that. I don't think anybody could have lived with Kenneth. Privacy is the most important thing in my life, and anything which invaded that would be a threat. So consequently, I live a life of celibacy. I am not interested in the other. <laughs> and I'd phone him up and I'd say, Fancy a bit of supper? No, dear, I'm not going out tonight. No, 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 no. And then ten minutes later, he'd find to oh, we suppose we could go. And, um, and we go to this lovely club I used to go to, where he loved chatting up the waiters. He had the best time. Oh, a trick, dear. Oh, there's one over there, dear. I mean, and he used to tell me, I mean, you know, I don't think anything ever happened in, in that part of Kenneth's life, certainly in those years, but uh, he used to love chatting up the waiters. He seemed to me that he was very often this rather supercilious, rather grand. Um, he was indeed very er erudite. He, he knew a great deal about many, many things. Music, he was well read. He was very highly intelligent. And then he could slip out of that on a, you know, just so quickly. And he could just scoop into this wild, mad, maniac, face-pulling, campy, outrageous character. And in the middle of this sequence, I let one go. It was the sort of lunch, you know, that lunch. <laughs> and, um, Do you mean you let one go as in you let one go? <laughs> right. <laughs> I think the dictionary term is eructation. <laughs> Anyway, it's all this, oh, you beautiful skin, lovely, lovely, lovely creature, you see, and then... Oh. And sometimes he was quite proud of himself for exceeding the limits. He would come back and write in his diary, I behaved disgracefully, and you know, he's loving it, yes. Because I have a cult figure, you see, I have an enormous cult. I am, I'm one, of the, one of the biggest cults you'll get round here, aren't you? 
but he was a different person when you had him without a crowd of people, when he only had two or three friends whom he knew. Uh, he, he was relaxed and, uh, and uh, sweet. He didn't want to uh, try to impress anybody with his performance. He was a man of such contradictions. I mean, huge contradictions. We, we would see each other a lot <laughs> because we lived closely. Sometimes I'd see him walking down the road. And some days he'd ignore me, walk past, and he'd make a thing, oh, no, I'm not going to talk to you today, dear. And, and just walk. Other, others, it was like he was an imp. He was a little boy. If I wrote a letter and got a word wrong or a spelling wrong, I would get a little note back, like a professor, saying, yes, this is quite a common mistake you've made here. Mm. <laughs> so, so on. I remember, I remember saying, I remember saying to Stanley Baxter, that is the correct pronunciation, he said, are you sure? I said, of course it is. You don't say epitome, you don't say penelope. All the Greek derivatives sound their final E. You say penelope and epitome and syndrome. And he said, well, I didn't know that. I've always said so. I would say, oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. Simple as that. And I met him a week later, and he'd come back from holiday, and said, you have a good time? He said, yes, we took off from Pisa. It's a charming little aerodrome. <laughs> we were going for lunch and then to the National Gallery, and it was quite odd, because it's the first time I've been out with him on my own. And he did insist walking down Shaftesbury, was it Shaftesbury? Shaftesbury Avenue, I think, on holding my hand. Which, again, you know, it, it, it's quite odd. You're thinking, what if one of my friends sees me? But I thought, well, I'm, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to look nervous about this. I'm not going to back off. I'll just do it. So I walked down the street holding his hand, and then he then he stopped. You know, I don't know if it was a kind of test or something to see, you know, what me, this straight bloke, would do walking down the road with a very well-known homosexual figure. Kenneth's friends were terribly important to him. They were his family, really. And I think that uh, he really appreciated the fact that all of the people who loved him let him into their families and to become a part of their lives. But, I mean, it was a wonderful pleasure for all of us to have him around. He used to come down to the country, and, and my son was little at the time, and his friends used to come around, and, and Kenneth would then begin to entertain the kids. And I'll never forget it, because everything that he was, all the mess, all the anxiety, the stress, the, the depression, the manic thing he had, the fear, the guilt, it would all sort of melt away completely. And, and out of this came this pure, pure innocence. He is one of Britain's most popular comedy actors. I remember seeing him in all those Carry On movies. He is the most English of any of the Englishmen I've ever met so far, Mr. Kenneth Williams. By the 1980s, Kenneth had all but abandoned acting but he carried on performing in his own inimitable style. But he aged, became very lined and, and thin and gaunt, and the body became gaunt. That's sad, all that. that that's an outward sign, I think, of something shriveling up uh, within himself. It became difficult for him because he wasn't doing the work that he'd done before. He wasn't so in demand, but he was still living with the Kenneth Williams carry-on character that people were seeing on TV from 20 years before. And, you know, sometimes people could be, although not meaning to, very hurtful, you know, shouting out things like, Ah, you big puffed around, are you? And, and you know, uh, for Kenneth, it may seem funny, but it wasn't funny. And I think in the end, he just used to run away and hide. Once you start, stop performing, uh, suddenly you are alone with yourself, there's no audience there, and that's when the dark moods would descend, and there's no companion to share your life or your bed with, or your jokes with, or cleaning your teeth with. Um, and that's when the demons would race in. But the problem in, in, the, in his later life was the fact that Louis no longer became uh, the companion she was. She'd got old and he had to look after her, and it becoming a full-time job. And then he came to us and he said, she's going in a home. And uh, I said, are you sure about this? He says, well, he said, no, but I, I, I think I'll have to talk to her about it. But he never did. He never actually, you know, said, OK, um, you're going into a home. Because then I think Ken still needed that comfort from, you know, from his mother. Although she lived next door, because he would have been very much on his own. I think he was in pain, yes, I, I do believe that. Um, not all the time. I think something could be a little act of Ken's, but uh, 
But you could tell, I think the last sort of four or five weeks of his life, uh, there was a very grey face there and he did look pretty poorly. Obviously there was a problem there. I think he was afraid it was cancer and he thought, you know, and the pain was very bad. And it did seem that he'd left it rather late. And I can understand anybody not feeling they can face up to going um, in and having an operation. What if life's a joke? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought? Have you ever thought, what if there's no one up there? What if it's all a joke? And I said, well, if it is, make it a good one. <laughs> I thought, I thought well, what else can you say? That's the only practical application, isn't it? Yes. In life, if we are here, we're faced with it. Get on with it. Yes, it's no it. good, you know, taking the, what do you call it, to poison the way out and all that stuff. It's no way out if you're on the trip or going on the outing together. You don't want people jumping off the coach half the time. You think, hello, what are they doing jumping off? Perhaps uh, they make your journey seem rather dreary, don't they? <laughs> and I hadn't seen him for a couple of years and I was amazed by how much he'd aged. It was still the same old Kenneth, but he almost seemed like a shell of his former self. And we went and had lunch and we chatted and he talked about the problems with Louis and how life was getting difficult and how the work wasn't coming in. But it was fine. And my last memory of Kenneth is he walked up to Oxford Street with me and I jumped on a bus to go down to Victoria Station. And I'll never forget this. I can see Kenneth now running down the street after the bus, waving goodbye to me. And that was the last time I ever saw him. Kenneth Williams died from an overdose of barbiturates in February 1988. He was 62. The coroner recorded an open verdict. This is from Kenneth's uh, diaries. I wonder if anyone will ever know about the emptiness of my life, or wonder about me and ask themselves what manner of man I was, how to ever tell them, how to ever explain, how to say I never found love. How to say it was all my fault? Who can say where it all goes wrong?